Okay, we're back. We're live with Talking Tax with Tom on a given Monday morning. Um, and the, Tom is the president of the Tax Foundation of, of Hawaii. And, and Tom, welcome back to your show. Nice to see you. My show? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me on your show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk about tax this morning. Let's talk about something that has interested me in the context of Hawaii for a long time, and that's tax incentives. And I suppose I spring you know, on that issue from, from the, uh, the sad story of uh, Act 221, which was intended to build a, a tech industry in Hawaii, and it was uh, adopted by the Caetano uh, legislature back in, I think, uh, let's see, 1989, I'm sorry, 1999, or perhaps the year 2000. And uh, right. Linda Lingle beat up on that, uh, that statute uh, for 10 years and then finally forced it to sunset early. Uh, and with, you know, of course, confidence is the firmest pillar of, of justice. And, uh, and uh, she eroded public confidence in the statute on a regular basis. And it, it never had a chance, you know, to, uh, to, do, to do what was intended to do. So, um, and that's, that's yeah, a, and, and I guess the counterpoint is, you know, from the legislature side of it, they, um, they, you know, they saw the tax credit running, they saw the amount of money that was, you know, going out the door and, and they, uh, they turned colors a few times. So, uh, the, the question then became, well, what, what exactly are we allowing? And, uh, when they kind of took a look at what actually was going through, uh, they they said, "Well, geez, none of this was was intended." Yeah, they were. They I remember that, and that was uh, an important issue and one we should talk about today. I mean, here's the economy of the state. Uh, here's all those kids leaving. Um, here's all those people who can't afford housing because their jobs don't pay enough. Uh, here's a mono economy, only one thing going on: tourism. Um, and so this was an important attempt. And uh, there were people in the ledge who thought this was the most important bill ever, ever passed in the state of Hawaii, because it, it realized the dream of John Burns, the dream of George Ariyoshi, and all the governors, for that matter, right on through Caetano. Um, and so the idea was to, uh, to build a tech industry, just like San Diego built a biotech industry back, back in the 60s, to make, to make Hawaii a high-tech place. And I have to say that when it failed, which was in 2010, because uh, Lingo was campaigning to uh, have it uh, sunset early, as opposed to sunset a couple of years after that. Um, when it failed, the tech industry failed. And uh, I remember talking to uh, all these young kids who had, who had come from the mainland to participate in this great experiment in Hawaii, the building of a tech industry, and they were leaving. They were going. They had had it. It was not just that, the, you know, there was no dollar and cents incentive that would bring capital into these uh, startups. It was more than that. It was a statement by the state government, and especially the governor, that they didn't care about tech. They didn't care about innovation. They didn't care about building an industry. They didn't care about broadening the economy. And these young kids said, well, you know, there's no future for me here. I'm leaving. I talked to a number of them. They left. So tax incentive is more than the dollars and cents. Tax incentive is a, is a statement by government to say, we want to, we want to do this, and we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. But I agree with you. From the very beginning, even before, you know, Company One had been established, even before, you know, there was any real opportunity for traction, um, the ledge and Lingle were making these, and, and uh, Sean, uh, Sean Howe in this Honolulu advertiser was criticizing the statute because it wasn't, uh, it was costing too much and it wasn't returning anything right now. They wanted to see a return right now. Um, and indeed, you know, the calculation was, uh, gee whiz, I, at one point it hit as much as 100, 150 million altogether. By the way, that's, that's a lot less than other tax credits that have been adopted. Um, but people were excited about that. And, and I guess the argument from the public was, something those who opposed it because of all the newspaper articles and opinion pieces, uh, they were saying, wait a minute, why are you giving a tax credit to these young kids doing tech? Why don't you give it to me? 
You're taking it out of my pocket and giving it to them. Wrong. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't agree with that. I oppose that. And so there was this great big groundswell of, we don't need no stinking tax credits. And for that matter, we don't need to incentivize development of a tech, a tech industry. And so that was the end. Well, of I think that one of the problems at the time, of course, was uh, that you know, the, 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 the technical aspects of the tax credit weren't really well defined. Um, there, there were, uh, you know, like seven or eight different categories of what we called qualified high tech businesses, uh, some of which didn't sound like tech at all. Uh, one of the big um, stories in the beginning, for example, was the movie. Blue Crush, which was uh, because movie development was identified as uh, um, tech related. I, I don't know how, uh, but it was included in the same rubric and it was uh, eligible for the same credits. And that's um, uh, kind of what happened. The, uh, you know, the, the, the producers of the movie uh, got a smart lawyer to write in uh, and and the um, uh, and the department had to rule that the movie was eligible. Well, I totally agree. There were abuses, and Blue Crush was was clearly uh, notoriously one of them. It was also the drop down corporations, where a, a wealthy local corporation could create a subsidiary and have the benefit of this tax credit. Um, where you know, I, I think it was more it was more intended for startups, not the a drop down subsidiary. But you know, as uh, as her advisors told her, um, Lingo, uh, you know, you can fix that with regulations. Uh, there's a section I'm sure you're familiar with it, Tom, and in, in uh, the federal regulations, it says if this is intended as a tax avoidance scheme, then it can't be used for that purpose. Um, and likewise, regulations are all over the Internal Revenue Code uh, to limit, you know, opportunities that people who are trying to do tax avoidance or take advantage of loopholes, uh, you know, will be stopped. I mean, you, you stop loopholes with changing the statute or building regulations that effectively um, deprive people who shouldn't have the benefit of a particular exemption or a tax credit. That was not done. Instead, Lingle was out yeah. there, Lingle was out there trying to punish investors. I remember, I, I remember the campaign by Lingle and- They were regulating by audit. Yeah, right. Um, and they, they had to turn their pockets out. They had to show you their, their, uh, their, their tax returns. I mean, make public disclosure, I think. Um, they, had to, they had to bend over uh, and, and um, reveal things that ordinary taxpayers, ordinary investors didn't have to reveal. And it was, was obviously intended to, be, to discourage. It was not intended to actually help the development, the refinement of the, of the statute. It was intended to discourage investors. And guess what? You can scare away investors pretty well. Hawaii has a great record of scaring away investors, including now. Um, but what, exactly. but what I enjoy most, and I'll stop after this, is the article in the paper written by Sean Howe. It was a banner headline, and it said, Act 221 investors found to be wealthy. Found, get that, Tom? Found to be wealthy. Um, this was a kind of, uh, you know, uh, journalism that we had in those days. It was the kind of position that Linda Lingle was taking uh, to, to punish investors. And after a while, there were no investors. So yeah, you, can't, you can't be rich. And yeah, who, else, who else invests, right? The, the idea, I mean, the idea, the idea of a wealthy investor, that's, that is really something. Of course, most investors in the world are wealthy. So it was ridiculous to, to make that headline and write that article. Um, however, let's talk about the policy. Um, would you agree with me that, it, that however the mechanics of the statute worked, and they, they tried hard, maybe with some, some success and, and some failure too, they tried hard to incentivize the tech industry. Because everybody, at least in the line of governors anyway, and lots of the legislature, enough to pass the bill, um, felt that it was a good thing for Hawaii. Um, that's why they passed it. Um, but don't you agree that that, that was a worthy, uh, a worthy goal, a worthy target for the state economy, and it was worth a tax credit? And if the tax credit you know, was, was not doing the job intended, either too much, too little, then you tune it up. 
That's what happened. That's exactly what happened in, in San Diego. Yeah. Right. So um, when you when you want as a society to uh, encourage certain kinds of behavior, you can you can do a couple of things. One, you can ban it. Uh, two, you can penalize it. Uh, three, you can incentivize doing the right thing. And this is one thing that the tax credit uh, is used for. Um, you know, sometimes I think tax credits are, are used for too many things that they shouldn't be used for. Uh, but this was one of the cases where it was used. Now, the uh, problem uh, is that when you have a tax credit, what you really want to do is, is you want to have some provisions that are very clear in what you're incentivizing. And, uh, you know, the, the more things you try to do with it, you know, the more unrelated uh, items you try to put in your laundry basket, uh, the, the, uh, the less clear it's going to be and the more people uh, who are you know, skilled in such things can try to drive a truck through what, you're, you know, what, what you've built up uh, you know, to, to, to get things that you weren't uh, intending to be incentivized uh, in under this tax credit. So uh, one thing that you want to see happen uh, is especially for, you know, to encourage a particular industry, is you want the credit to taper off over time. And uh, and you want to stop it after X number of years, you know, supposedly after the industry has had a chance uh, to get established and, and get going. Because uh, you can't have an industry running on tax credits forever. Um, I, you, I think, I think you, that's all true. Uh, and I would I don't know exactly, but I would guess that's what happened in San Diego. And that was what was supposed to happen under Act 221 uh, and other tax credits. Um, but I think, you know, Hawaii does not have a good track record with this uh, in terms of uh, making it simple, uh, expressing, you know, the purpose, expressing the need uh, and making everyone understand it and avoiding loopholes that people could drive trucks through. Uh, and that's that's not you know, uh, a failure of concept. It's a, fa it's a failure of the, getting down into the details and writing a good bill. Uh, so how do you yeah, write a failure of execution. Yeah, and, and, and of course, in executing it. It was a piece on 60 Minutes last night about marijuana in Northern California, the Emerald Triangle, they called it. And uh, there were, there were, uh, there were, there were th and of course, it's legal, right? But uh, the, the state and the counties involved in that area have found ways uh, to de-incentivize uh, the growing of marijuana. And they have all kinds of little ways, that, you know, to stop the growers, especially the, the small growers. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a thousand cuts is what it is. You can take a perfectly valid intention, a perfectly valid statute, and then you can cut at it, which is what happened here. Uh, for example, uh, investors having to turn their pockets out. Um, so you really need to have a focused program. You need to have the legislature and the governor, the leadership, if you will, uh, remember why the thing was adopted in the first place and not try to pull the rug out from under it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the, one of the big problems uh, that happened during Act 221 was uh, there, were, you know, there were changes made to it um, for, for, I think, the wrong reasons. Uh, the you know the uh, the credit program was going it was you know losing tons of money uh, and you know proponents came to the legislature and said well it was it was said scheduled the sunset on X date but let's have a few more years let's have maybe ten more years um, and uh, and they did get a couple of extensions through uh, not not because really they uh, they had an industry that was viable and going uh, but because uh, what they had was, um, let's say, inaccurate, and and uh, it wasn't really hitting the people that it was supposed to hit, and uh, and people were trying to fix it to make it better. Yeah, and then there was a certain amount of complaint going on in the community about a, a statute that that only uh, addressed a, a small subsection, but that was a subject, and it should have been addressed. That was a subsection of the people who would build it. You know, in, uh, say, 19, uh, 2000 or so, the kids were coming back from Silicon Valley. I could name some. 
Uh, they were there, they made some money, they had cut their teeth, they learned about technology, uh, and they were ready to come back to Hawaii and build an industry. It was addressed to them. Uh, they, were the, they were the intellectual property people. They were the vital, energetic you know, generation who was going to do this. But when the bill got beat up that way, they stopped. They went into real estate. <laughs> I'm serious. They went into real estate, gave up tech, gave up entrepreneurial activity. What a crushing blow this was to the future of the state. If you look back at you know, our time here, Tom, our professional time here, if you want to see you know, some of the big mistakes the state has made, that was one of them, crushing the opportunity. The other thing is, it had, yes, it had a certain period of time before its sunset. And sunset, as you said, is appropriate for an incentive. After a time, you should not need it anymore. But they didn't know at the beginning how long it would take. In San Diego, it took decades. In this case, they only had a few years on it, and that was a guess. The whole idea at the outset was we don't know how long it's going to take for this to have traction. So we have to be flexible about the, the period of time. Um, they were not flexible. They were always trying to cut it back and knock it off. So, the, you know, the, the result is, uh, you know, a lack of flexibility on this is, is fatal. And that's one of the reasons the reason. bill died. Right. Anyway, so, but let's talk about tax, tax incentives in general. I mean, we've had, we had a tax incentive on electric cars. There are 10,000 or fewer electric cars here in the state of Hawaii in a population of something, you know, 1.5 million, which has a, a total number of cars of over a million. So the percentage of electric cars against the incentive of all the cars is 1%. I get that right? 1%. Right. Now, if we yeah, want to... The, uh, the, the uh, tax credit for electric cars is primarily federal. Um, we, we give stuff like, you know, giving them special license plates that allow them free parking and, you know, uh, entrance into the carpool lanes and stuff. But, but we, we don't give a monetary credit for electric cars. We did. We did. We gave them, we gave them uh, uh, something over and above the federal credit. I forget the exact yeah, It wasn't amount. that much, as I recall. It was, uh, it was uh, several thousand dollars for a car, and, and, um, and it was, had a sunset on it, and the sunset was pretty tight, and it came and went, and it ended, and that was that, and it's only the federal credit. Now, you can say the federal credit should be adequate, but it hasn't been. Somebody has to be watching this. We only have 1% of electric cars in the state. I mean, if, if I were king, if you were king, and we had decided that we wanted to have a fleet of electric cars, that we wanted to really be green and not, and not spend $6 billion or $7 billion on importing, you know, gas um, into the state to drive all these cars, we would do something. We would de disincentivize gas cars, fossil fuel cars, and we would incentivize electric and hydrogen cars. Um, we haven't done that. So it should be or no you, surprise. Or you, would ban the, or you would ban the fossil fuel cars. That's, that's, that's another thing. Or or you could enact mandates, which is, you know, we had talked about uh, City Council Bill 25 to um, impose building requirements in all new buildings. And they, they would have required, I think, 25% of the, uh, of the stalls, parking stalls in any new either residential or commercial building uh, to, to be uh, EV ready. Now, I mean, that's... Um, that, that got, got people going haw, uh, but that's one way to, to achieve that um, policy objective as well. I mean, what you, what you need to do is kind of strike a balance between, uh, you know, being, you know, uh, the carrot and the stick, so to speak. Oh, I totally agree. In other words, uh, you know, if you or I were, were king, uh, we wanted to do something about this. We wanted to change the numbers. We want to be the, the state with the highest percentage of electric cars in the, in the United States. We would find carrots and sticks both. And in a few years' time, we would achieve our goal. And we wouldn't need either carrots or sticks because everybody would come along. They would have to. You know, the problem is political will. That was the problem in 221, and it's the problem in electric cars. You know, for the life of me, I don't understand why. On the one hand, we talk about electric cars. We tell everybody we have all these electric cars, but we don't. Um, and on the other hand, we don't do anything about it. 
there's aside from um, you know allowing free parking at the airport, which is not entirely free, uh, or free parking at meters, which is not entirely free. Um, you know, we don't we don't tell me if I'm wrong. We don't do anything. We don't do anything to incentivize this. And then we they were surprised that we're behind the curve on it. This is not the only situation uh, in which a tax incentive or some kind of other incentive or carrot or stick, you know, would change public conduct. But in Hawaii, everybody loves their cars. They love the sound of that engine. They love that big $70,000 truck or that huge SUV. They love to do it with fossil fuel. They're going to oppose the spending of big money for an incentive. They're going to oppose carrot and stick against fossil fuel cars because they're invested in fossil fuel cars. Right. So um, there are, I guess, currently some, some things going on uh, that may change the mix. Uh, the Department of Transportation has been kind of after this for some time because, you know, their highway fund is fed uh, by fuel tax. Uh -huh. So uh, so if you don't use uh, fossil fuel, uh, you don't contribute to the, uh, to the maintenance or upkeep of the roads. And they say, ooh, this is a big problem. So, so we, so they are, they are now kind of going along the path of uh, adopting a what we call RUC or road usage charge, uh, which is going to be based on mileage, as opposed to uh, based on the amount of gas you you use. Yeah, is that happening? This, it's 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 uh, it's running down the tracks. I mean, don't just use, last don't month, use that don't use that uh, metaphor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, just trying to keep did this. I, did I open up something? You know, they don't open up an old wound or something. Yeah, but you know, but, for but example, I'll take another one: homelessness. Okay, we really haven't done much on homelessness. Dwayne Carisu, but he, you know, has done a little village. Um, but but he's a he's a wealthy man, and and uh, you know he can afford to do it. He can afford to uh, arrange things that you and I cannot arrange. Um, and there's not too many like him. And so, you know, where exactly is the homeless village happening, the next one? And can we have homeless villages for all the homeless? Uh, there are 15, 20, 25,000 people that could use uh, a homeless village. I mean, a good one, one that provides all kinds of benefits. And how do you do that? Well, you know, they get some charities and, and some people uh, with kind hearts give to those charities. And the churches who get money from, you know, their parishioners, they give money for the homeless. But is there, I don't know the answer, maybe you do, is there a governmental effort in which governmental money is going into helping the homeless? And if not directly into the homeless, uh, what about tax credits? For example, if I wanted to build a, a homeless village, how about getting the land free or cheap? How about a holiday from income tax or a holiday from real property tax or gross excise tax? for my efforts at helping the homeless. I don't think any of that really exists. So there's no real incentive or disincentive that's happening to actually make this happen. Um, yeah. When are we gonna learn about uh, changing public conduct using tax and other incentives and disincentives? There's a, uh, what I know is that there's a, a governor's coordinator on homeless. I, I know the guy, he's, he's um... Uh, you know, Scott Morris, he, he works out of the governor's office, um, and he's supposed to be, uh, you know, building an inter interagency coalition between state and federal and uh, and county governments uh, to address this problem. What, what has actually happened or come out of it, I'm not really sure. Um, well, I think the, uh, operative, the operative word you use, he's out of the governor's office. Yeah, he has a little wee office there on the fifth floor of the Capitol. He doesn't have staff, or if that staff, it's minimal. And he doesn't have a budget. Um, so is that, is that really the kind of effort uh, that it will take to correct, to, um, you know, uh, ameliorate the homeless problem? I don't think so. That's not enough. That's not a statement of we really care about this. You know, what about giving him $100 million? Go for it, Scott. Uh, do something. <laughs> Figure out a plan. Make it happen. <laughs> They're not doing that. Nobody's doing that. <laughs> Yep, nobody's doing that. That, that <laughs> I agree with. 
So this is a huge, big problem in the state. And we, you know, it's, a, it's one, of those, one of those sacred cow type problems where yes, we give it lip service, but we actually don't do anything. Yes, we, we like to see innovation and entrepreneurship and tech, tech companies, but we don't do much to help them. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's it's oh, almost a religious really concept. Cool. If God wanted there, if God wanted the homeless to be could not be homeless, he would give them homes. God is not involved in this equation. Right. God is not involved in this equation. Just a man that caring for one's fellow man and, and then and then you know, for how long, you know, I mean, is this gonna be a forever thing or um you know the the uh, the opposite side of that equation is okay. Well, you give people some money uh, if they have you know, if, even if they're not doing anything and they have no production and no uh, no no life. Um, okay, so now it's better to do nothing and get this money as opposed to doing uh, you know work at McDonald's or Burger King or wherever it is and getting some minimal amount of money. Uh, so what do you do? And these fiscal questions are huge. Why? It's something that you and I talked about before a number of times. And that is the state can't pay its regular bills. So what, you know, the, you got to have a plan uh, like San Diego. You got to say, we want to we wanna have a really terrific economy. We want the economy, economy to hum. Uh, we want to have income here. It comes into the state. We want to be able to tax that. And we want to have the money to, you know, pay for the right things. Unfortunately, we don't have a robust economy. Um, a lot of the money in the, in the tourism industry goes offshore. Um, and the wages in the tourism industry are not, are not great. And so what, what happens is... Um, and we're taxing it more heavily year, year after year. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, so, you know, the, the result is... Um, uh, we, we, we don't have an economy that yields a lot of tax um, and by virtue of the economic activity. And so we can't pay our bills. We're way behind, you know, I mean, various estimates of unliquidated liabilities of 40, 50, 60 billion dollars. Sounds like Puerto Rico, you know. Um, and so uh, uh, you, you've got to do a jump start on things. You've got to build the economy. And I frankly do not understand why we don't do that. Do you understand why we don't do that? No, I don't understand why we don't do that. The um, uh, Hawaii Executive Council recently came up with a uh, with a big paper on that, and and they said, you know, and you know, and I was I was I was part of this effort. Uh, they said, hey, look, we we really need to look at what we need to do to get the state back on track. Um, I.e., you know, we got we got crumbling bridges. We have uh, maintenance backlogs. We have, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff that has been neglected and it's and it's just starting to fall into disrepair. Uh, so, what is it going to take to get us back to, to the status quo? And I think that the number that they came up with was like uh, like eighty billion dollars. You know, th this is a, a kind of number that requires planning. I mean, it, 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 there, there are people, I think, in the legislature and elsewhere who, who deny that a problem exists. Right. There's a problem. And they, and they, don't, they don't understand about how tax, uh, either more tax or tax incentives, can actually affect the economy and uh, 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 public you know, perceptions, public conduct, and public confidence in the economy. Anyway, I think we're out of time, Tom, but it's been great talking to you, and I really enjoy the remote, and uh, I hope we can talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me on the show. Tom Yamachika, President of Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Always enjoy. Aloha, Tom.